I read public domain books here on Leaves of Glen. That's the only books I can read without getting sued. So it limits my material uh, to people that wrote a really long time ago. And everyone who lived a really long time ago were racist or homophobic or sexist or anti-Semitic or xenophobic. Uh, Anything you can imagine, they were it. Because that's just the way people were back then. And they all wrote books. So if anything I read today is offensive or upsetting, uh, don't hold me responsible. My hands are tied. There's nothing else for me to read. You could always turn it into a drinking game or something. Oh, me? Yeah, I got to keep my job. With a heavy heart, I survived the one big round of layoffs where a ton of people got let go. Um, I was both relieved and ashamed that I'm so dependent on this job. Uh, But that is the way life goes. If we've learned anything from all the books I've ever read on this podcast, from The Iron Heel to Picture of Dorian Gray, uh, to these collection of short stories I've been doing lately, it's... The presiding theme is that's the way things go. Um, and just stop thinking about it so much. So, moving forward with my life, I am going to record a Christmas episode so that you can have something for you and your whole family to sit around and listen to uh, while you open presents, which is totally a reality that I expect to happen, that there will be people with their children opening gifts and my voice just wafting out or across their warm, rosy-cheeked faces. And prideful bellies. I've uh, picked out The First Christmas Tree by Henry Van Dyke. It's a story that I actually read a long time ago when I had a Palm Pilot back in 1999 or 98. Uh, tiny little useless things with glowing green screens. I found out you could download a book to it, open your public domain books, and you can uh, sit around reading on it until the battery dies after like an hour. And uh, I just fell in love with the whole thing. First book I read was The Haunted Bookshop. I thought it was just the coolest thing I ever read. Or, not really. I just liked being able to sit in the bathroom with the lights off, reading. But, so, next book I got was The First Christmas Tree by Henry Van Dyke. A story of a bunch of people at church on Christmas Eve. And they all decide that they gotta get out in those woods and get those heathens out there believing in Jesus. So, it's a message that I'm sure will offend a lot of people, but uh, it's also a a message of Christmas. So, let's uh, dive right in and enjoy The First Christmas Tree by Henry Van Dyke. The Call of the Woodsman The day before Christmas, in the year of our Lord 722. Broad snow meadows glistening white along the banks of the river Moselle. Pallid hillsides bloomed with mystic roses where the glow of the setting sun still lingered upon them. An arch of clearest, faintest azure bent overhead. In the center of the aerial landscape of massive walls and of the cloister of Faisal, gray to the east, uh, purple to the west, silence all over all, a gentle, eager, conscious stillness diffused through the air like a perfume, as if earth and sky were hushing to themselves uh, to hear the voice of the river faintly murmuring down the valley. In the cloister, too, there was silence at the sunset hour. All day long there had been a strange and joyful stir among the nuns. A breeze of curiosity and excitement had swept along the corridors and through every quiet cell. The elder sisters, the provost, the deaconess, the stewardess, the portress, with her huge bunch of keys jingling at her girdle, had been hurrying to and fro, busied with household cares. In the huge kitchen, 
There was a bustle of hospitable preparation, the little bandy-legged dogs that kept to the spits, turning before the fires, had been trotting steadily for many an hour until their tongues hung out for want of breath. The big black pots, swinging from the cranes, had bubbled and gurgled and shaken and sent out puffs of appetizing steam. St. Martha was in her element. (laughs) It was a field day for her virtues. The younger sisters, the pupils of the covenant, convent, eh, had forsaken their Latin books and their embroidery frames, their manuscripts and their miniatures, their miniatures, and fluttered through the halls in little flocks like merry snowbirds, all in black and white, chattering and whispering together. This was no day for tedious task work, no day for grammar or arithmetic, no day for picking out illuminated letters in red and gold on stiff parchment, or patiently chasing intricate patterns over thick cloth with a slow needle. It was a holiday a famous visitor had come to the convent. It was Winfred of England, whose name in the Roman tongue was Boniface, and whom men called the Apostle of Germany. A great preacher, a wonderful scholar. He had written a Latin grammar himself. Think of it! And he could hardly sleep without a book under his pillow. But... More than all, a great and daring traveler, a virtuesome pilgrim, a high priest of romance. He had left his home and his fair estate in Wessex. He would not stay in the rich monastery of Nutaskel, even though they had chosen him as the abbot. He had refused a bishopric at the court of King Earl. Nothing would content him but to go out into the wild woods and preach to the heathen. Ah. Up and down through the forests of Hesse and Thuringia, 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 and along the borders of Saxony, he had wandered for years with a handful of companions, sleeping under trees and crossing mountains and marshes, now here, now there, never satisfied with ease and comfort, always in love with hardship and danger. What a man he was, eh? fair and slight, but straight as the spear and strong as an oaken staff. His face was still young. The smooth skin was bronzed by wing and sun. His gray eyes, clear and kind, flashed like fire when he spoke of his adventures and of the evil deeds of the false priests with whom he had contended. What tales he told that day, not of miracles wrought by sacred relics, nor of courts and councils and splendid cathedrals uh, through. He knew much of these things. He had been at Rome and received the Pope's blessing. That day he had spoken of long journeyings by sea and land, of perils by fire and flood, of wolves and bears and fierce snowstorms and black nights in the lonely forest, of dark altars of heaven gods and weird bloody sacrifices and narrow escapes from wandering savages. The little novices had gathered around him. Their faces had grown pale and their eyes bright as they listened with parted lips, entranced in admiration, twinning their arms about one another's shoulders and holding closely together, half in fear, half in delight. (laughs) The older nuns had turned from their tasks and paused in passing by to hear the pilgrim's story. Too well they knew the truth of what he spoke. Many a one among them had seen the smoke rising from the ruins of her father's roof. Many a one had a brother far away in the wild country to whom her heart went out night and day, wondering if he were still among the living. But now the excitements of that wonderful day were over. The hours of the evening meal had come, and the inmates of the cloister were assembled in the Refractory. Refractory. <laughs> how come I don't know how to say that one? That seems weird. I'll just look it up real quick. Refectory. 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 The inmates of the cloister were assembled in the refectory. On the dais sat a stately abbess, Adulla, daughter of the king Deobert. De- Dagbo- Dagobert. That's not a name I'm looking up. Looking a princess indeed in her violet tunic with the hood and cuffs of her long white robe trimmed with fur and a snowy veil resting like a crown on her snowy hair. And at her right hand was the honored guest and at her left hand was her grandson, the young Prince Gregor, a big manly boy uh, just returned from school. The long shadowy hall with its dark brown raiders and beams, the 
double rows of nuns with their pure veils and fair faces, the ruddy flow of the slanting sunbeams striking upwards through the tops of the windows and painting a pink glow high up on the walls. It was all as beautiful as a picture and as silent. For this was the rule of the cloister, that the table should sit in stillness for a little while, and then one should read aloud while the rest listened. "'It is the turn of my grandson to read today,' said the abbess to Winifred. "'You shall see how much he has learned in the school. "'Read, Gregor. The place of the book is marked.' "'The tall lad rose from his seat and turned the pages of the manuscript. "'It was a copy of Jerome's version of the scriptures in Latin, "'and the marked place was in the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians, "'the passage where he describes the preparation of the Christian as the arming of a warrior for glorious battle, the young voice rang out clearly, rolling the sonorous words without slip or stumbling to the end of the chapter. Winifred eh, listened, smiling. Ah, oh, my son, said he, as the reader paused, that was bravely read. Understandest thou what thou readest, hmm? Surely, father, answered the boy, it was taught to me by the masters at Treves. And we have read this epistle, the uh, apostle, clear through from the beginning to the end, so that I almost know it by heart. Then he began to repeat the passage, turning away from the page as if to hmm, hmm, show his skill. Hmm. But Winifred stopped him with a friendly lifting of the hand. No, not so, my son. That was not my meaning. When we pray, eh, we speak to God. And when we read, it is to God who speaks to us. I ask whether thou hast heard what he has said to thee in thine own words, in common speech. Come, give us again the message of the warrior and his armor, his battle, and the mother tongue, so that all can understand it. Eh? The boy uh, hesitated, blushed, stammered, then came round to Winifred's seat, bringing the book. Take the book, my father, he cried. And read it for me. I cannot see the meaning plain, though I love the sound of the words. Religion, I know, and the doctrines of our faith, and the life of priests and nuns in the cloister, for which my grandmother uh, designs me, though uh, it likes me little. And fighting, I know, that the life of warriors and heroes, for I have read it in Virgil and the ancients, and heard a bit from the soldiers at Treves. And I would fain taste more of it, for it likes me much. But how the two lives fit together, or what need there is for armor for a clerk in holy orders, I can never see. Tell me the meaning, for if there is a man in all the world that knows it, I'm sure it's none other than thou. So Winifred took the book and closed it, clasping the boy's hand with his own. Hmm. Let us first dismiss the others to their vespers, he said, lest they should be weary. The sign from the abbess, a chanted benediction and murmuring of sweet voices and the soft rustling of many feet over the rushes on the floor, the gentle tide of noise flowed out through the doors and ebbed away down the corridors. The three at the head of the table were left alone in the darkening room. Then Winifred began to translate the parable of the soldier into the realities of life. At every turn he knew how to flash a new light into the picture out of his own experience. He spoke of the combat with the self and the wrestling with the dark spirits and solitude. He spoke of the demons that men had worshipped for centuries in the wilderness and whose malice they invoked against the stranger who ventured into the gloomy forest. Gods, they called them, and told strange tales of their dwellings among the impenetrable branches of the oldest trees and in the caverns of the shaggy hills of their riding in the wind horses and hurling spears of lightning against the foes. Gods, they were not. But foul spirits of the airs and rulers of the darkness, there were not glory and honor in fighting with them and daring their anger under the shield of faith and putting them to flight with the sword of truth. Eh, eh, what better adventure could a brave man eh, ask than to go forth against them and wrestle with them and conquer them? Look you, my friends, said Winifred, how sweet and peaceful is this covenant tonight uh, on the eve of the nativity of the Prince of Peace, exclamation point. It is a garden full of flowers in the heart of winter, a nest among the branches of a great tree shaken by the winds, a still haven on the edge of the tempestuous sea. Uh, and this is what religion means for those who are chosen and called to quietude and prayer and meditation. But out yonder, in the wide forest, who knows what storms are raving tonight in the hearts of men? 
Through all the woods are still, who knows what haunts of wrath and cruelty and fear are closed in tonight against the advent of the Prince of Peace. And shall I tell you what religion means to those who are called and chosen to dare and to fight and to conquer to the world of the Christ? Question mark. It means to launch out into the deep. It means to go against the strongholds of the adversary. It means to struggle to win an entrance for their master everywhere. What helmet is strong enough for the strife save the helmet of salvation? What breastplate can guard against uh, a man against these fiery darts but the breastplate of righteousness? What shoes can stand aware of these journeys but the preparation of the gospel of peace? Uh, shoes, he cried again and laughed as if a sudden thought had struck him. <laughs> he thrust out his foot covered with a heavy cowhide boot, laced high about his leg with thongs of skin. You see here how a fighting man of the cross is shod. I have seen the boots of the Bishop of Tours, white kid, <laughs> embroidered with silk. A day in the bogs would uh, tear them to shreds. I have seen the sandals that the monks use on the high roads. Yes, and worn them. Ten pair of them I have worn out and thrown away in a single journey. Now I shoe my feet with the toughest hides. Hard as iron, no rock can cut them, no branches can tear them. Yet more than one pair of these have I outworn, and many more shall I outwear ere my day journeys are ended. And I think, if God is gracious to me, that I shall die wearing them. Better so than in a soft bed with silken coverings. The boots of a warrior, a hunter, a woodsman. These are my preparation of the gospel of peace. Come, Gregor, he said, laying his brown hand on the youth's shoulder. Come, wear the forester's boots with me. This is the life to which we are called. Be strong in the Lord, a hunter of the demons, a subduer of the wilderness, a woodsman of the faith. Come! Exclamation point. The boy's eyes eh, sparkled. He turned to his grandmother. He shook her head vigorously. Nay, father, she said. Draw not the lad away from my side with these wild words. I need him to help me with my labors, to cheer my old age. Do you need him more than the master does? asked Winifred. And will you take the wood that is fit for a bow to make a distaff? But I fear for the child thy life is too hard for him. He will perish with hunger in the woods. Once, said Winifred, smiling, we were camped by the bank of the river Ohuru. The table was spread for the morning meal, but my comrades cried that it was empty. The provisions were exhausted. We must go without breakfast, and perhaps starve before we could escape from the wilderness. While they complained, a fish hawk flew up from the river with flapping wings and let fall a great pike in the midst of the camp. There was food enough to spare, and never have I seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. But the fierce pagans uh, have the forest, cried the abbess. They may pierce the boy with their arrows or dash out his brains with their axes, but he is but a child too young for the dangers of strife. A child in years, replied Winifred, but a man in spirit. And if the hero must fall early in battle, he wears the brighter crown, not a leaf withered, not a flower fallen. The aged princess eh, trembled a little. She drew Gregor close to her side and laid her hand gently on his brown hair. Ah, uh, I'm not sure that he wants to leave me yet. Besides, there is no horse in the stable to give him now, and he cannot go as befits a grandson of a king. Gregor looked straight into her eyes. Grandmother, said he, dear grandmother, if thou wilt not give me a horse to ride with this man of God, I will go with him eh, afoot. Next tiny chapter, The Trail Through the Forest. Two years had passed to a day, almost to an hour, since that Christmas Eve in the cloister of Faisal. A little company of pilgrims, less than a score of men, were creeping slowly northward through the wild forest that rolled over hills of central Germany. At the head of the band marched Winifred, clad in a tunic of fur with his long black robe girt high about his waist, so that it might not hinder his stride. The hunter's boots were crusted with snow. Drops of ice sparkled like jewels along the throngs that bound his legs. There was no other ornament to his dress except the bishop's cross hanging on his breast and the broad silver clasp that fastened his cloak about his neck. He carried a strong, tall staff in his hand, fashioned at the top into a form of a cross. Close beside him, 
keeping step like a familiar comrade, was the young Prince Gregor. Long marches through the wilderness had stretched his limbs, broadened his back, and made a man of him in stature as well as in spirit. His jacket and cap were of wolfskin, and on his shoulder he carried an axe with broad shining blade. He was a mighty woodsman now and could make a spray of chips fly around him as he hewed his way through the trunk of a spruce tree. Behind these leaders followed a pair of teamsters, ugh, guiding a rude sledge, loaded with food and the equipment of a camp, and drawn by two big shaggy horses, blowing thick clouds of steam from their frosty nostrils. Tiny icicles hung from the hairs on their lips. Gross. Their flanks were smoking. They sank above the fetlocks at every step in the soft snow. Last of all hmm, came the rear guard, armed with bows and javelins. <coughs> It was no child's play in those days to cross Europe afoot. The weird woodland, somber and illimitable, covered hill and vale, table land and mountain peak. There were wide moors where the wolves hunted in packs as if the devil drove them in tangled thickets where the lynx and a boar made their lairs. Fierce bears lurked among the rocky passes and had not yet learned to fear the face of man. The gloomy recesses of the forest gave shelter to inhabitants who were still more cruel and dangerous than the beasts of prey. Outlaws and sturdy robbers and mad werewolves and bands of wandering pillagers. The pilgrim who would pass from the mouth of the Tiber to the mouth of the Rhine must travel with a little army of retainers or else trust in God and keep his arrows loose in the quiver. The travelers were surrounded by an ocean of trees so vast so full of endless billows that it seemed to be pressing on every side to overwhelm them. Gnarled oaks with branches twisted and knotted as if in rage rose in groves like tidal waves. Smooth forests of beech trees, round and gray, swept over the knolls and the slopes of the land in a mighty ground swell. But most of all, the multitude of pines and firs, innumerable and monotonous, with straight, stark trunks and branches woven together an unbroken hood of darkest green, crowded near the valleys and over the hills, rising on the highest ridges into sagged crests like the foaming edge of breakers. Through this area, shadows ran a narrow steam of, uh, stream of shining whiteness, an ancient Roman road covered with snow. It was as if some great ship had plowed through the green ocean long ago and left behind it a thick, smooth wake of foam. Along this open track, the travelers held their way heavily, for the drifts were deep. Warily, for the hard winter had driven many packs of wolves down from the moors. The steps of the pilgrims were noiseless, but the sledges creaked over the dry snow, and on the painting of the horses throbbed through the still cold air, the panting of the horses, I can't read anymore, the pale blue shadows on the western side of the road grew longer. The sun declining through its shallow arch, drop behind the treetops. Darkness followed swiftly as if it had been a bird of prey waiting for the sign to swoop down upon the world. Father, said Gregor to the leader, surely this day's march is done. It is time to rest, to eat and sleep. If we press onward now, we cannot see our steps. It will not that be against the word of the psalmist David, who bids us, not to put confidence in the legs of a man. Hmm. Winifred laughed. Nay, my son Gregor, he said, thou hast tripped even now upon thy text. For David said only, I take no pleasure in the legs of a man. And so say I, for I am not minded to spare the legs of mine until we come further on our way and do what must be done this night. Draw the belt tighter, my son, and hew me. Out this tree that is fallen across the road, for our campground is not here. The youth obeyed. Uh, two of the foresters sprang to help him, and while the soft fir wood yielded to the stroke of the axes and the snow flew from the bending branches, Winifred turned and spoke to his followers in a cheerful voice that refreshed them like wine. Courage, brothers, and forward yet a little. The moon will light us presently, and the path is plain. Well know I that the journey is weary, and my own heart wearies also for the home in England. Where those I love uh, are keeping fast this Christmas Eve. But we have to work to do before we feast tonight, for this is the Yule tide, and the heathen people of the forest have gathered in the Thunder Oak of uh, Gismar to worship their god, uh, Thor. Uh, 
Strange things will be seen there in the deeds which make the soul black, but we are sent to lighten their darkness, and we'll teach our kinsmen to keep a Christmas with us, such as the woodland has never known. Forward then, and let us stiffen our feeble knees. A murmur of assent came from the men. Even the horses seemed to take a fresh heart. They flattened their backs to draw the heavy loads and blew the frost from their nostrils as they pushed ahead. Eh, gross with all the ice on noses. The night grew broader and less oppressive. A gate of brightness was opened secretly somewhere in the sky. Higher and higher swelled the clear moon flood until it poured over the eastern wall of the forest into the road. A drove of wolves howled faintly in the distance, but they were receding, and the sound soon died away. Their stars sparkled merrily through the stringent air. The small round moon shone like a silver. Little breaths of the dreaming wind wandered and whispering across the pointed fir tops. As the pilgrims toiled bravely onward, following their clue of light through a labyrinth of darkness. After a while, the road began to open out a little. There were spaces of meadowland fringed with alders behind which a boisterous river ran, clashing through the spears of ice. Rude houses of hewn logs appeared in the openings, each one casting a patch of inky blackness upon the snow. Then the travelers passed a larger group of dwellings, all silent and unlighted, and beyond they saw a great house, with many outbuildings and enclosed courtyards, from which the hounds bayed furiously, and a noise of stamping horses came from the stalls. But there was no other sound of life. The fields around lay bare to the moon. They saw no man except that once, uh, on a path that skirted the farther edge of the meadow, three dark figures passed by, running very swiftly. Then the road plunged again into a dense thicket, traversed it, and climbing to the left, emerged suddenly upon a glade, round and level except at the northern side, where a swelling hillock was crowned with a huge oak tree. It towered above the earth, a giant with contorted arms, beckoning to the host of lesser trees. Here, cried Winifred, as his eyes flashed and his hand lifted his heavy staff. There is the thunder oak, and here the cross of Christ shall break the hammer of the false god Thor. Eh, I think I just heard a mouse. If you hear a snapping sound go off during this reading, it means a mouse just got killed. Next tiny chapter, The Shadow of the Thunder Oak. Withered leaves still clung to the branches of the oak, torn and faded banners of the departed summer. The bright crimson of autumn had long since disappeared, bleached away by the storms and the cold. But tonight, these tattered remnants of glory were red again, ancient bloodstains against the dark blue sky. For an immense fire had been kindled in front of the tree. Tongues of ruddy flame, fountains of ruby sparks ascended through the spreading limbs and flung a fierce illumination uh, upward or around, ward and around. Uh, the pale, pure moonlight that bathed the surrounding forests was quenched and eclipsed here. Not a beam of it uh, sifted downward through the branches of the oak. It stood like a pillar of cloud between the still light of heaven and the crackling, flashing fire of earth. But the fire itself was invisible to Winfred and his companions. A great throng of people were gathered around in a half circle, their backs uh, to the open glade, their faces uh, toward the oak. Seen against the glowing background, it was but a silhouette of a crowd, vague, black, formless, mysterious. The travelers paused for a moment, at the edge of the thicket, and took counsel together. "'It is the assembly of the tribe,' said one of the foresters. Uh, "'The great uh, knight of the council. I heard of it three days ago as we passed through one of the villages. All who swear by the old gods have been summoned, and they will sacrifice a steed to the god of war and drink blood and eat uh, uh, horse flesh to make them strong. It'll be at the peril of our lives if we approach them. At least we must hide the cross if we would escape death. Ah, ah, hide me no cross, cried Winifred, lifting his staff, for I have come to show it and to make these blind folks see its power. 
There is more to be done here tonight than the slaying of a steed, and a greater evil to be stayed than the shameful eating of meat sacrificed to idols. I have seen it in a dream. Here the cross must stand and be our red. At his command, the sledge was left in the border of the wood, with the two of the men to guard it, and the rest of the company moved forward across the open ground. They approached unnoticed, for all the multitude were looking intently toward the fire at the foot of the oak. Then Winfred's voice rang out, Hail, uh, ye sons of the forest! A stranger claims the warmth of your fire in the winter night. Swiftly, and as with a single motion, a thousand eyes were bent upon the speaker. The semicircle opened silently in the middle. Winfred entered with his followers. It closed again behind them. Then, as they looked around the curving ranks, they saw that the hue of the assemblage was not black, eh, but white, dazzling, radiant, solemn white. Eh. The robes of the women clustered together at these points of the wide crescent, white, with glittering burnies of the warriors standing in the close ranks, white, the fur mantles of the aged men who held the central place in the circle, Ugh, white, <laughs> with the shimmer of silver ornaments and the purity of lamb's wool. The remnant uh, of the little group of children who stood close by the fire, uh, all, all white, uh, with awe and fear, the faces of all who looked at them, and over all flickering, dancing radiance, the flames played grimly like a faint, uh, vanishing, vanishing tinge of blood on snow. The only figure untouched by the glow was the old priest, Hunrad with his long, spectral robe, flowing hair and beard, and dead pale face, who stood with his back to the fire and advanced slowly to meet the strangers. Eh, uh, who are you? Whence come you? Uh, what, what seek you here? His voice was heavy and toneless as a muffled bell. You, kings, kinsmen, am I of the German Brotherhood, answered Winifred, and from the England. Hmm. Beyond the sea I have come to bring you a greeting from that land, and a message from the All-Father, whose servant I am. Uh, welcome, then, said Hunrad. Welcome, kinsmen, and be silent, for what passes here is too high to wait. It must be done before the moon crosses the middle heaven, unless, indeed, thou hast some sign or token from the gods. Canst thou work miracles? The question came sharply as if a sudden gleam of hope had flashed the tangle of the old priest's mind. But Winifred's voice sank lower, and a cloud of disappointment passed over his face as he replied, Nay, miracles have I never wrought, though I have heard of many, but the All-Father has given no power to my hands to save such belongings uh, to common man. Stand still, then, thou common man, said Hunrad, scornfully, and behold what the gods have called us uh, hither to do. This night is the death night of the sun god, Baldur the Beautiful, beloved of gods and men. This night is the hour of darkness and the power of winter, of sacrifice and mighty fear. This night the great Thor, the god of thunder and war, to whom this oak is sacred, is grieved for the death of Baldur and angry with this people because they have forsaken his worship. Long is it since an offering has been laid upon this altar. Long since the roots of the holy tree have been uh, fed with blood. Therefore, its leaves have withered uh, before the time, and its boughs are heavy with death. Therefore, the Slavs uh, and the Wends have beaten us in battle. Therefore, the harvests have failed, and the wolf hordes have ravaged the folds, and the strength has departed from the bow. And the wood of the spear is broken, and the wild boar is slain the huntsman. Therefore, the plague has fallen upon our dwellings, and the dead are more than the living in all of our villages. Answer me, ye people. Hmm, hmm. Are these things true? A hoarse sound of approval ran through the circle, a chant in which the voices of the men and the women blended. Like the thrill of wind in the pine trees above the rumbling thunder of the waterfall rose and fell in rude cadences. O oh, Thor the Thunderer, mighty and merciless, spare us from smiting. Uh, heave not thy hammer angry against us. Plague not uh, thy people. Take from our treasure, richest of ransom, silver we send thee, and jewels and javelins, goodliest garments, all of our possessions, prices we proffer, sheep 
we will slaughter steeds, will we sacrifice. Bright blood shall bathe thee, O tree of thunder. Eh, Life floods shall lave thee. Strong wood of wonder, mighty have mercy. Smite us no more, spare us and save us. Uh, Spare us, Thothar. With two great shouts, the song ended. In a stillness followed so intense that the crackling of the fire was heard distinctly. The old priest stood silent for a moment. His shaggy brows swept down over his eyes like ashes, quenching flame. Then he lifted his face and spoke, None of these things shall please the God. More costly is the offering that shall cleanse your sin. More precious the crimson dew that shall send new life into this holy tree of blood. Thor claims your dearest and your noblest gift. Hunrad, moved nearer to the handful of children who stood watching the red mines in the fire and swarms of spark serpents darting upward. They had heeded none of the priest's words and did not notice now that he approached them. So eager are they to see which fiery snake would go highest among the oak branches. Foremost among them, and most intent on the pretty game, was a boy, like a sunbeam, slender and quick, with blithe brown eyes and laughing lips. The priest's hand was laid upon his shoulder. The boy turned and looked up in his face. Here, said the old man, with his voice vibrating when a thick rope is strained by a ship swinging from her moorings. Here is the chosen one, the eldest son of the chief, the darling of the people. Eh? Hearken, Bernhard, wilt thou go to Valhalla, where the heroes dwell with the gods, to bear a message to Thor? Hmm? The boy answered, swift and clear. Yes, priest, I will go if my father bids me. Is it far away? Shall I run quickly? Must I take my bow and arrows for for the wolves? The boy's father, the chieftain Gundhar, standing among his bearded warriors, drew his breath deep. Oh, he's embarrassed, and leaned so heavily on the handle of his spear that the wood cracked. And his wife, Irma... Bending forward from the ranks of the women, pushed the golden hair from her forehead with one hand. The other dragged at the silver chain about her neck until the rough links pierced her flesh, and the red drops fell unheeded on the snow of her breast. A sigh passed through the crowd, like a murmur of the forest before the storm breaks. Yet no one spoke save Hunred. I love that everyone's embarrassed for this kid. Yes! My prince, both bow and spear shalt you have, for the way is long, and thou art a brave huntsman. But in darkness thou must journey for a little space, and with eyes blindfolded. Fearest thou? Not fear I, said the boy, neither darkness, nor the great bear, nor the werewolf, for I am Gundar's son, and the defender of my folk. Then... The priest led the child in his raiment of lamb's wool to a broad stone in front of the fire. He gave him his little bow tipped with silver and his spear with shining head of steel. He bound the child's eyes with a white cloth and bade him kneel beside the stone with his face to the east. Unconsciously, the wide arc of spectators drew inward toward the center as the ends of the bow draw together. When the cord is stretched, Winfred moved noiselessly until he stood close behind the priest. The old man stooped to lift a black hammer of stone from the ground, the sacred hammer of the god of Thor. Summoning all the strength of his withered arms, he swung it high in the air and it poised for an instant above the child's fair head, (laughs) then turned to fall. One keen cry shrilled out from where the women stood. Take me, take me, not Bernard. The flight of the mother towards her child was swift as the falcon swoop, but the swifter still was the hand of the delivery. Winifred's heavy staff thrust mightily against the hammer's handle. As it fell, sideways it glanced from the old man's grasp, the black stone striking on the altar's edge, split in twain. A shout of awe and joy rolled along the living circle. The branches of the oak shivered. The flames leaped higher as the shout died away from the people and saw the Lady Irma with her arms clasped around her child. And above them... On the altar stone, Winifred, his face shining like the eh, the face of an angel. Next tiny chapter, the felling of the tree. A swift mountain flood rolling down its channel, a huge rock tumbling from the hillside and falling in midstream, the baffled waters broken and confused, pausing in their flow, dash high against the rock, foaming and murmuring with divided impulse. Hmm. Uncertain whether to turn to the right or the left. 
Even so, Winifred's bold deed fell into the midst of the thoughts and the passions of the council. They were at a standstill. Anger and wonder, reverence and joy, and confusion surged through the crowd. They knew not which way to move. To resent the intrusion of the stranger was an insult to their gods, or to welcome him as the rescuer of their darling prince. The old priest crouched by the altar, silent. Conflicting counsels troubled the air. Let the sacrifice go forward. The gods must be appeased. Nay, the boy must not die. Bring the chieftain's best horse and slay it in his stead. It will be enough. Eh, the holy tree loves the blood of horses. Not so. There is a better counsel yet. Seize the stranger whom the gods have led hither as a victim and make his life pay for the forfeit of his darling. The withered leaves on the oak rustled and whispered overhead. The fire flared and sank again. The angry voices clashed against each other and fell like opposing waves. Then... The chieftain Gundhar struck the earth with his spear and gave his decision. All have spoken, but none are agreed. There is no voice of the council. Keep silence now, and let the stranger speak. His words shall give us judgment, whether he is to live or die. <laughs> Winifred lifted himself high upon the altar, drew a roll of parchment from his bosom, and began to read. A letter from the great bishop of Rome who sits on a eh, golden throne to the people of the forest, Hessians, the Thurgrians, Franks and Saxons, in a name, uh, Nomini Domini, Sancte et Individui, uh, Trianus, Amen. A murmur of awe ran through the crowd. It is the sacred tongue of the Romans, the tongue that is heard and understood by the wise men of every land. There is magic in it. Listen. Winifred went on to read the letter, translating it in a speech of the people. We have sent upon you our brother Boniface, and appointed him to your bishop, that he may teach you the only true faith, and baptize you, and lead you back from the ways of error to the path of salvation. Hearken to him in all things like a father, bow your hearts to his teaching. He comes, not for earthly gain, but for the gain of your souls. Depart from evil works, eh, worship is not eh, the false gods, for they are devils. Offer no more bloody sacrifices, nor eat the flesh of horses, but do as our brother Boniface commands you. Build a house for him, that he may dwell among you, and a church where you may offer your prayers to the only living God, the Almighty King of Heaven. It is a splendid message, proud, strong, peaceful, loving. The dignity of the words imposed mightily upon the hearts of the people. They were quieted as men who have listened to a lofty strain of music. Tell us then, said Gundhar, what is the word that thou bringest to us from the Almighty? What is it thy counsel for the tribes of the woodland on this night of sacrifice? This is the word, and this is the counsel, answered Winifred. Not a drop of blood shall fall tonight, save that uh, which pity has drawn from the breast of your princess. In love for her child, not a life shall be blotted out in the darkness tonight, but the great shadow of the tree which hides you from the light of heaven shall be swept away. For this is the birth night of the white Christ, son of the All-Father and Savior of mankind. Fairer is he than Baldar the Beautiful, greater than Odin the Wise, kinder than Freya the Good. Since he has come to earth, the bloody sacrifices must cease. The dark Thor, on whom you vainly call, is dead. Deep in the shades of Nephilim, he is lost forever. His power in the world is broken. Will you serve a helpless god? Eh. See, my brothers, you can call this tree his oak. Does he dwell here? Eh. Does he protect it? The troubled voice of assent rose from the throng. The people stirred uneasily. Women covered their eyes. Hunrad lifted his head and muttered hoarsely, Thor, eh, take vengeance. Uh, Thor, Winfred, beckoned to Gregor. Eh, bring the axes. Thine and one for me. Now, young woodman, show thy craft. Eh, the king tree of the forest must fall, and swiftly or else all is lost. The two men took their places facing each other, one on each side of the oak. Their cloaks were flung aside, their heads bare. Carefully, they felt the ground at their feet, seeking a firm grip on the earth. Firmly, they grasped the axe halves and swung the shining blades. Tree God, cried Winifred, art thou angry? Thus we, we smite thee. Tree God, answered Gregor, art thou mighty? Thus we fight thee. Clang, clang. 
The alternate strokes beat time upon the hard ringing wood. The axe heads glittered in their rhythmic flight like fierce eagles circling about the quarry. The broad flakes of wood flew from the deepening gashes in the sides of the oak. The huge trunk quivered. There was a shuddering in the branches when the great wonder of Winifred's life came to pass. Out of the stillness of the winter night, a mighty rushing noise sounded overhead. Was it the ancient gods on their white battle steeds with their black hounds of wrath and their arrows of lightning sweeping through the air to destroy their foes? Question mark. A strong, whirling wind passed over the treetops. It gripped the oak by its branches and tore it from its roots. Backward it fell like a ruined tower, groaning and crashing as it split asunder in four great pieces. Winifred let his axe drop and bowed his head for a moment in the presence of the almighty power. Then he turned to the people. Here is the timber, he cried, already felled and split for you, new building, and on this spot shall rise a chapel to the true God and his servant, St. Peter. And here, said he, as his eyes fell on a young fir tree standing straight and green with its top pointing toward the stars amid the divided ruins of the fallen oak, here is the living tree with no stain of blood upon it. That shall be the sign of your new worship. See how it points to the sky? Let us call it the tree of the Christ child. Take it up and carry it to the chieftain's hall. You shall go no more into the shadows of the forest to keep your feasts with secret rites of shame. You shall keep them at home with laughter and song and rites of love. The thunder oak has fallen, and I think the day is coming when there shall not be a home in all Germany where the children are not gathered around the green fir tree to rejoice in the birth night of Christ. So they took the little fir from its place, and carried it in joyous procession to the edge of the glade and laid it on the sledge. The horses tossed their heads and drew their load bravely as if the new burden had made it lighter. When they came to the house of Gandar, he bade them throw open the doors of the hall and set the tree in the midst of it. They kindled lights among the branches until it seemed to be tangled full of fireflies. The children encircled it, wondering, and the sweet odor of the balm filled the house. Then Winifred stood beside the chair of Gandhar and on the dais of the end of the hall and had told the story of Bethlehem, of the babe in the manger, of the shepherds on the hills, of the host of angels and their midnight song. All the people listened, charmed into stillness. But the boy Bernhard on Irma's knee, folded by her soft arm, grew restless as the story lengthened. He began to prattle softly at his mother's ear. Mother, whispered the child, why did you cry out so loud when the priest is going to send me to Valhalla? Oh, hush, child, answered the mother, and pressed him closer to her side. Mother, whispered the boy again, laying his finger on the stains upon her breast. See, your dress is red. What are these stains? Did someone hurt you? The mother closed his mouth with a kiss. Dear, be still and listen. The boy, the boy obeyed. His eyes were heavy with sleep. He was... He heard the last words of Winifred as he spoke the angelic messengers, flying over the hills of Judea and singing as they flew. The child wondered and dreamed and listened. Suddenly his face grew bright, put his lips close to Irma's cheek again. Oh, mother, he whispered very low, do not speak. Do you hear them? Those angels have come back again. They are singing now behind the tree. And some say it is true, but others say it was only Gregor and his companions at the lower end of the hall chanting their Christmas hymn. All glory be to God on high, and to the earth be peace. Goodwill henceforth from heaven to men, begin and never cease. The End Well, what do we learn? We learn that if you see a little boy being sacrificed to a pagan god, uh, put a stop to it. And if they're worshipping a tree that uh, validates them murdering a little boy, chop down that tree, if for no other reason but to let them know that you mean business. How do we apply that to our modern times? Uh... Pretty much the same thing. If you're walking around on Christmas Eve and you see a little boy that's about to be sacrificed, stop him. Uh, I'm not being facetious. It seems like a good Christmas message. And if they happen to be standing next to something, like a telephone pole or even a tree if you're lucky, 
knock that thing over just to let them know you're serious. Uh, it seems like a good, kind-hearted thing to do uh, on the night of the birth of our of our Lord. So keep that in mind and spread that message to your children. Uh, I hope you enjoy your holidays with your families and friends and or pets or whatever you have. Uh, and that uh, you'll tune in for the next episode. I may take time off because of the own, my own holiday thing. Or not. We'll find out. And on this special uh, holiday episode, I would like to say hi to my one listener in the Republic of Lithuania. I see that you're still listening. Someday you won't. It's not like you have to feel obligated. I just really appreciate you still are. That's kind of neat. So, with whatever you celebrate, I hope you uh, enjoy it. Thanks again.